Let's check out the solution challenge. Let's do this. Okay, I'll present my screen. Welcome to the Google Developer Student Club's 2021 Solution Challenge. The mission of this challenge is to use Google technology to solve for one of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, aiming to end poverty, ensure prosperity, and protect the planet. Win cool prizes, mentorship from Google, and swag. Get help along the way from Google at training events, code labs, and hackathons. Submit your solution by March 31st, 2021. Register today. We can't wait to see what you build. Let's get started. Wondering how to pull off a massive international conference online? Introducing AirMeet Conference, a format that lets you host vibrant and lively conferences virtually. To create a summit, click the Create an AirMeet button in the dashboard. On clicking, a pop-up box appears that lets you choose between a meetup or a conference event. Choose conference to create and host impactful multi-track summits. Enter the details and click on Create AirMeet to create the summit. Once you create the AirMeet conference, an event link is generated. On the day of the event, you just gotta click on the link and start the AirMeet. You will land in the reception area. The reception is the official welcome area for your participants and speakers. Here, they can see what's happening live on stage, go through their personal bookmark sessions, see the list of event sponsors, and visit their websites. Also access personal and public chats. Hold on, we've got another surprise here. Don't forget to add a splash of your brand color to the interiors of the event to ensure a higher brand recall. To see where the actual action is happening, click on the sessions icon on the navigation bar to your left. AirMeet's virtual stage can host multiple engaging sessions in parallel. Whoa, ain't that brilliant? Participants can find the schedule of the sessions, choose a live session that they want to attend, and just join in, whereas speakers and hosts can go to the backstage directly from the schedule tab to prep up for their session. The backstage is an exclusive private space for speakers and hosts to sync up before and after the session. Click on the Start Session button to go live. Upon entering the live session, your participants can find many interactive features such as chat, Q&A, and emoticons to make the live session more engaging. Participants can use the Raise Hand feature to join speakers live on stage stage. This is great for audience engagement. Speakers can use live polls and also play pre-recorded videos in between sessions to engage your audience and perhaps give a shout out to your partners. How about branding your stage backdrops? Yes, you heard me right. Add some zing to your sessions with attractive backdrops. And why not? Leave a mention to your partners on the backdrops too. Not just that. Allow participants to access the list of people attending the same session and interact with them in the session chat feed or through direct messages. During a session, if participants want to network and meet others, then the lounge is the place to be. The lounge is a one-of-a-kind interaction area wherein participants can meet new people and build meaningful connections. This can be done either through speed one-on-one -on -one networking or group conversations at the virtual tables. Moving ahead from the lounge, you will reach the arena. The arena is a virtual booth exhibition area that offers enticing booth spaces to exhibitors to position their offering, meet with prospects that are interested in their offerings, and capture leads for their business. Participants can just click on the stall they are interested in to enter and catch up with the booth representatives in the booth lounge for swift video chats, demos, and discussions. Prospects can simply click on the CTA, I am interested, to send their contact details to the exhibitors to take the discussion forward. The exhibitors details like brand logos, graphics, videos, marketing collaterals, and their social media plugins can be customized here. Features like the reception, sessions, lounge, and arena of AirMeet give a grand conference experience to your participants, speakers, sponsors, and exhibitors. But what makes AirMeet Conference convenient for hosts is that it is built to offer a highly customized event experience. The dashboard is the place where you can get a comprehensive overview of your event and also get to modify the event details according to your requirements. In the Venue Settings tab, you can upload the event logo and a welcome banner. You can also include your featured sponsor to the banner. In the Sessions tab, you can add multiple sessions and edit the session details as per your event. 
Go to the Speakers and Host tab to add speakers and hosts to your event and assign speakers to their particular sessions. You can set up exhibitor booths in the Booths tab. Click on the Add Booth button, enter details, and that's it. The booth has been added. Click on the Sponsors tab to create and modify different tiers for your event sponsorships and add sponsors to the specific tiers. Finally, go to the Tickets tab to set up different ticketing slabs for your event. You can find all of this and much more in the paid plan of the AirMeet conference. Host global conferences from wherever you are. AirMeet. Developer Student Clubs train thousands of student developers globally and work with their communities to solve real life problems. Google selects amazing students from across the globe once a year to be a Developer Student Club lead and start a club on their campus. These leads believe knowledge is power and that technology can do extraordinary things for the world. They take on the responsibility to help students learn and empower these students to solve real problems around them. Join us in building a global community for students. Let's check out the solution challenge. Let's do this. Okay, I'll present my screen. Welcome to the Google Developer Student Club's 2021 Solution Challenge. The mission of this challenge is to use Google technology to solve for one of the United Nations 17 sustainable development goals, aiming to end poverty, ensure prosperity, and protect the planet. Win cool prizes, mentorship from Google, and swag. Get help along the way from Google at training events, code labs, and hackathons. Submit your solution by March 31st, 2021. Register today. We can't wait to see what you build. Let's get started. Developer Student Clubs are university-based communities where students learn about Google technology and use their skills to solve local problems. Developer Student Club's 2020 Solution Challenge Demo Day.
Hi everyone, thank you for joining this afternoon section. We are starting now. Please note that this event will be recorded. Welcome to Ideaton Day 2, Section 2. How are you guys feeling this afternoon? Is it awesome or great? Do comment them down in the Zoom chat. Before we start, let me introduce to you what is Developer Student Club for those that are new to our club. Developer Student Clubs are university-based community groups for students interested in Google Developer Technologies. Students from all undergraduate or graduate programs with an interest in growing as a developer are welcome. By joining a DSC, you will be able to grow your knowledge in a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment and build solutions for local businesses and their community, which will be helping you bridge the gap between theory and practice. Feel free to visit us at Linktree to find out more about us. Next, here are some of the house rules. Firstly, please enter your full name when joining this Zoom section for identification and attendance purposes. Also, kindly please mute your microphone to reduce unnecessary feedback, which may be disruptive. And also, no offensive or rude language to be used verbally or in the chat box. Next, if you have any questions, do feel free to leave them down in the chat box and we will be answering them at the end during the Q&A segment. For those, in, for those inappropriate or sensitive questions, the moderators and speaker have the right to reject them. And finally, moderators reserve the right to remove participants who do not observe the house rules. Thank you once again for joining this afternoon section too. I'm Daniel and I will be the host for this section. Here is the agenda for today. The first topic will be on what are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and how to achieve using technology. The second topic will be on quality education. And lastly, there will be a Q&A section. Now, we will be moving on to the main segment. We are very happy and honored to have two amazing speakers here with us today. First up, we have Dr. Adrian Tan. Adrian is founder of One Strategies. Adrian is an advocate of change, ethics, and sustainability for business, business and organizations. He currently researches on the future of work. He is also a practicing consultant. Ideating new knowledge and capability in sustainability and well being for individuals, organizations, and communities. So now I will pass it on to Adrian. Adrian, please. All right. Can you hear me? Just a check. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I'll just uh, share my screen now and. Uh... Nice to provide this talk to you on the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. 
So I'll just get the share screen. Uh, Daniel, just a quick check. If I'm going to share screen, I'm going to play a video. The audience will be able to hear the video, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, can because I'm very used to Zoom instead. <laughs> okay, get it, get it. Okay. All right. I hope everyone's doing well, and uh, it's nice. Uh, of the uh, student group to invite me over on this uh, online platform to provide you with a uh, half hour interactive, I'll, I'll make it interactive, right? half hour talk on uh, what exactly are the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, uh, being the developments club that you are in, I'd definitely be interested in how to achieve uh, these goals using technology and henceforth uh, the title. I'm the founder of uh, small consulting company, advising companies and individuals in implementation of strategies. And uh, one of the interests that I have is currently on the future of work and how it links with uh, uh, this uh, sustainable development at large. And of course, when you talk about sustainable development, then people normally refer to uh, the SDG. And I think this topic will be of interest to all of you uh, because I believe there's student groups and this is an idea thorn kind of hackathon uh where the idea of coming up in this hackathon is to um develop um innovative solutions through the use of in this case that google technologies uh to achieve at least one of the 17 uh, un sdg goals okay so um before i start i want to make it very interactive let's do a poll i'm going to put out a poll uh, uh portal soon so I'd just like you to all in audience, um, even the non-audience can participate, right? What, uh, think about what comes to your mind uh, when you think about sustainability. In fact, the first thing that comes to mind is normally the truth. So we just want to see what's in your mind and then perhaps then, you know, you make the talk more interesting about the UNSDG. Okay, so I'll get the poll up and just spend a couple of minutes to get your ideas. All right, so just uh, use your more gadgets, triple, go to this uh, website, www.menti.com, and then use the code 22036092. And um, you can put in, uh, all right, uh, your thoughts, uh, consider what comes to mind when you think about sustainability. And you allow multiple entries, so we'll see what comes out. And you'll start to see a word cloud forming as we get the entries in. Nice. So we have the first one and hopefully you get about a few and you have a very fantastic looking word cloud. And it's kind of research here. We just want to see what comes up. It's uh, strikingly common among your minds uh, when people think about sustainability. So we'll see how it develops in the next few minutes.
Okay, it's going to start looking interesting as we have more. And just to share with you, in case you do not know how to read a word cloud, um, it's a visualization of inputs. So as the words get bigger or bolder, right, it means that would be the common thought right, concerning uh, sustainability. So, okay, let me just see how it goes. Okay, we just take about two more minutes, all right, then uh, we'll head down the road with this talk. This is just a, a starter. Very good. Okay, so we see a lot of words coming up. All right, you can continue to add in if you want, and you can continue to add. You have the, you have the, you have this, uh, the, the, the URL, you have the code. You can continue to add, right, right after I've, I'm continuing to my presentation. Um, and I just wanted to see if, let's say, you're in the right mind. Yes, we're starting to see things like SDG goals that comes to your mind. Um, the words all getting a little same size, which means that they are of equal importance, all right? Because uh, I was expecting about 50 people. So, um, and we, we do have the keywords meeting current needs, all right? Uh, education is definitely important. And then we talk about things we got relating to the environment. Right, green earth and all this kind of, of course, we include the money inside, the economy, the profit, and of course, the living, right? So then it's nice to see people plan. Yeah, all these are the, the right words. So good, you are in the right frame of mind concerning sustainability. Now, if you look at this bird cloud, actually, the takeaway here is people look at sustainability in different ways. People think about sustainability in different ways. But the good news is, Right. At least we now have something coming from the United Nations and from the UN SDG goals that is actually trying to, you know, try to bridge all these differences and amalgamate all the different perceptions about sustainability into one common platform right, so that we can achieve uh, sustainable development in terms of the, the goals that you're going to talk, I'm going to talk about later right? for, for the betterment of the world around us. As I see a lot of, I think, climate change, environment are one of those keywords we're trying to get at. Yeah, so this is basically the crux of it. The question in your mind now should be, how are we going to use technology all right, to deal with these issues that you have put in the work cloud? How are you going to use technology? All right, and this is an interesting discussion. Okay, so I'm now going to just switch back to my slides. And thanks for the poll. And we now, now that you shared with me and everyone else uh, your thoughts about what sustainability is all about, let's get down the road with trying to understand a few things. So the takeaway today would be uh, just two, two key questions. What exactly are the UN Sustainable Development Goals? All right, and that's basically, I think, the intent of their whole idea thon. And of course, last but not least, the important part of your hackathon would be how can you use actually, how might you want to use technologies all right, to achieve these goals? All right, uh, at least one of it. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, from information that I've actually uh, found actually through my research. Okay, so I'm just going to play a video, all right, and uh, just to give a preamble and an introduction on the 17 goals, all right, and then there'll be some explanation. So the question is, do you know all the 17 SDG goals, uh, sustainable development goals? And of course, uh, some of you may have viewed this video, but not, but it's a very nice short one to two minute video to quickly introduce newbies in the sustainable development, what exactly are the uh, SDGs?
Okay, so these are the 17 goals. And so to sum up, all right, that was the video. And so welcome, all right, in your view now are all the 17 SDG goals that was developed by the world, every member state of the United Nations. And have a good glance, all right, have a good glance at, at these uh, goals. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, all right, right to the bottom, peace, justice, and strong institutions and cause partnership for the goals, sorry, which is the means of achieving these goals. Look at it. These are actually goals that seem you know, not very monetary in nature, except maybe for goal number eight. All right, these goals are meant, if you look at it, it's about really about the well-being of people. All right, but it's becoming really very important all right, to achieve this goal as a world. And I guess that's why this idea thorn that you are taking part in is actually good because a lot of uh, uh, different facets of society and businesses are actually embarking to achieve these goals. But of course, the question is how do we exactly go about achieving these goals? And there are many ways. And of course, technology is one of those ways. And that's the route that uh, you'll be taking this uh, idea thorn. So now that we have a good glance at what these 17 goals are, I'll have a deeper explanation of what these goals are because you definitely need to know these goals in order for, because this is a boot camp and you need to know what these goals are so that you can use technology and develop some innovative technology using Google platforms all right, all right, to come up with something that can help achieve one of these goals all right, for the world around you. So let's go a little bit back to history. How did these 17 goals come about? How did it all start? Right, how did we get to, we're not Mount Everest yet, although, but the UN SDG goals is really like climbing Mount Everest, and that is where we want to get. But where was base camp? So it all started way back in the year 2000. And so this is 2021, this just started 2021. So that's basically, if you just negate 2021, it's just 20, 20 years ago. And so most of you would probably be under 10 years old, but already born, all right? So it all started way back in year 2000 as the Millennium Development Goals. At that time, uh, uh, we had goals, all right, to improve the world around us, society, living standards and everything. But it was termed as the Millennium Development Goals and were the only, there were only eight. So that was in the period year 2000, 2015. So before the year 2000, there was no talk about any development goals all right, for society in the world. Nothing. Everybody was more in the mode of making money. And that was basically how it was like uh, in the 1990s, actually. It was all about economic growth uh, and profit, prosperity. That was the message. And the world prospered, of course. So in the year 2000, leaders from 189 countries who were members of the United Nations all right, agreed to this Millennium Development Goals. There were only eight to look at that. All right, and you might find that some of these eight goals are quite similar to the 17 goals, but of course, uh, there were improvements. So they agreed to a vision for the new millennium. How it was year 2000, so they felt that with the new millennium, they needed to do something all right, for social good. And the main idea, the main trust of the Millennium Development Goals was to end extreme poverty by 2015. So if you thought go backwards to 2015, five years ago, did we actually end poverty? And now do we still have poverty? I think you know the answer. So then with that, you can gauge whether the achievement of these goals was attained and was the world successful in this vision to achieve uh, the end of extreme poverty by 2015. So you might agree that there is still poverty, but of course, it's not that bad. The MDGs, the eight MDGs, did achieve some things. All right, more than a billion, according to UNDP, all right, the United Nations Development Program, uh, more than a billion people were lifted out of poverty since 1990. And of course, the, the MDGs accelerated it, the, the, the movement. 
child mortality it means child death dropped by more than half. Um, the number of out of school children also dropped more than half. So that more people, more children in all parts of the world, especially the third world countries, developing countries, were able to gain uh, actually free education. And of course, when it comes to health, HIV and AIDS were the big issues then. And of course, that fell by, fell by almost 40%. All right. So these were some of the achievements. All right. But uh, by 2015, that means 2014, but it doesn't mean that we managed to eradicate poverty and put every children into school but at least there was some improvement. So while there are improvements, right, more still needs to be done. Right? Because today, and this is again according to the UNDP, there are still over 800 million, in the world, people, 800 million people in the world who are still living in poverty on less than USD $1.25 per day, um, especially in the African region. Uh, one out of nine people goes to sleep hungry all right, and deforestation is a big issue. We are burning trees, plantations, just to make way for cities and skyscrapers of, of agriculture. Uh, oceans are becoming more polluted and acidic because of the activities that we do industry on land and we actually pollute the sea in industrial ways. And of course, we do a lot of fishing and that threatens marine ecosystems and henceforth would also threaten our food security. Unfortunately, while we did improve the number of children going to school, one six of adults in the world are still illiterate. And of those who are still illiterate, actually the majority are still women. So that's why the concentration is a lot more women. And this days, that's why in the past week, I think that International Women's Day. So therefore, because more needs to be done, not everything was achievable during the time of the MDG. And by 2015, you know, uh, it was decided that, okay, we needed a new set of goals to get forward, all right? So the UN member states uh, in 2015 agreed to adopt a new set of goals, and this were known as the Sustainable Development Goals, total 17 goals, and embedded within the 17 goals, if you actually Google and read about the goals, uh, within the 17 goals uh, are targets set, and a total of 169 targets, and some of the targets are actually measurable, all right, that the world has to achieve. Every, the whole world, every country, all right, every nation, every country, hopefully, and then drill down to even organizations. And that was basically the heart of the 2030 agenda. So this goals developed, agreed on and developed in 2015 out of the meeting in New York in September, right, led to uh, the 2030 agenda, which basically means to achieve these goals. And it was agenda for people, planet, and prosperity. Not just for prosperity, but to take care of the people and of course the planet. And these 17 goals in agreement would help the world uh, and the components of the the world, planet Earth, right, societies and everything, to be able to balance the three pillars of sustainable development. So when we talk about sustainable development, we're basically talking about not just about people, planet, profit. In other words, analogously, we're not talking about social progress, economic growth, and environmental protection, not just this. We're talking about how social progress, economic growth, and environment protection are interlinked right, and to balance this. Right. So we cannot do this three things that you see here, three, you cannot work on the, these pillars individually, right? There has to be a fine balance because if you have too much social progress, then that could jeopardize economic growth. And if you have too much economic growth, then it can be environmental protection. So when you talk about sustainable development, it's really about balancing these three pillars. That means you've got to do things right, to balance this. And therefore the 17 goals were developed as a means Right, for people to come up with actions, course of actions to balance this, to, to do, to implement sustainability by providing a balance in the actions in social progress, economic growth, and environmental production. So therefore, all these 17 goals are not to be taken in silos. In fact, they are integrated and indivisible because each of these goals that you see here affects one another, actually. So you can't go too extreme. Actually, rightfully speaking, if you pick one, it might detrimentally affect the other. So this is a little hint for your project. So because they're integrated and invisible, right? This means that, like, just to illustrate how integrated they are, right? Ending poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education. All right. So that's why people say, right? One way of ending poverty is to improve education. That is why we want to put more people, uh, more children in education to have at least basic education because education is the means to end poverty because they can get jobs out of it. So that's all linked, and. This is basically uh, 
what the 2030 agenda for sustainable development is about. It's to achieve these 17 goals together as an integrated and indivisible system. So we've actually got less than a decade left. The aim is to get this to 2030. And we are now in 2010. We actually wasted, if you read the UN website, we can kind of wasted 55 years. Nothing much was done. So it's urgent. Time is running out because the climate is changing, as you all know and can feel it, especially in the pandemic time. The planet's transforming. We see a lot of natural disasters, strange ones. And we also have diseases coming up, as you can see, and the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are also more people on Earth than ever before, all right, more so in the developing world. So the implications are three questions. Can people actually have enough of what they need? You know, can we have enough of what we need living within our planetary boundaries? And you know, there are nothing is actually, you know, infinite. Our planet Earth that we live on is finite. Can we eradicate extreme poverty? With the MDGs, we couldn't do it completely. Can we really protect our environment? All right? Even though we have the Paris Agreement, look at the state of the Paris Agreement. So it's a matter of really balancing the three pillars, all right? And because this earth is what we all have in common. So we have to take care of the people by ensuring prosperity, uh, foster peace, all right? Protect the environment. And what better way to do this than through enforcing some partnership among uh, stakeholders on the earth that we live in. And therefore, we need the 17 goals to achieve sustainable development. So what's in it for us? So no poverty would mean, so in the 17 goals, right, this is basically what we should do. We should end poverty in all forms, everywhere, end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all, all ages, ensure inclusive and equitable education, and promote lifelong learning. And this is what a lot of countries are actually trying to do now, especially in the developing world. Gender equality is also very important, especially on the part of women, empowering more women and, and girls uh, right, right, to climb up uh, lives ladder, ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation, ensuring healthy lives and promote well-being for all uh, at all ages, and of course to ensure that uh, every country has sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth. That is why a lot of countries, including Singapore, are now talking about inclusivity in everything that we do, and not just for the rich and famous. Um, industry and innovation fund things, right? build infrastructure that promotes inclusive and sustainable industrialization. So that's why I talk about things like sustainable. See, so this kind of goal nine links to goal 11 about making cities and human settlements that are inclusive, safe and sustainable. Right, right? Lots of recycling can go on. And that's how what makes cities sustainable. And reduce inequalities in countries, ensure responsible consumption and not over consume right? as that's becoming important, no zero wastage. Um, take action to combat climate change, look after life below water and on land, all right? and definitely ensure peace, justice, and strong institutions, because if you don't ensure peace, justice, and strong institutions, there cannot be any sustainable development. If there's war, anarchy in the world, obviously, we can't do all those things. And last but not least, all right, to have good partnerships all right, among all stakeholders in the world. So how do we leverage? So now that we've understood Right, really what is in it for us, the 17 goals, we now come to the important part, which is how do you leverage technology right, to achieve SDG goals? Now, being, I think most of you are science students, you just have to understand that technology is, uh, is a very big word. It's not getting you to invent. It's basically using existing scientific knowledge or existing uh, gadgets that you have right, to put things together, to integrate together, right, to produce some innovation. Right, to solve something. Right, so this is what we basically talk about when we say leverage on technology. And technology is existing. It's application of science, actually. You're not asking you to invent science. We just use asking you to apply right, science, knowledge that's existing or systems that are existing, all right, technologies existing. Right? Do it in a different way all right, to solve something. In this case, right, solve a world problem to achieve the SDG goals. So this is, uh, I'm going to give you some policy uh, directions first. So according to the 2013 agenda, and this has been actually outlined in the, the UN agenda, actually, technology cooperation is very important. As you know, goal 17 is actually cooperation integration. No man can work alone. No nations can work alone. 
And but of course, the issue is the the the, the poor countries uh, like, cannot adopt technology because of, like funds and budgets. So therefore, cooperation is very important. North South developing world must help the the, the 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 developed world must help the developing world. South South developing countries must cooperate. All right, and triangular, uh, regional, international cooperation means you know all facets of society, organizations must come together and work and have access all right, to science, technology, innovation together. That's basically what we need. All right, there must be some cooperation among all stakeholders. The next one is technology development. All right, there must be um, policies from national governments to promote the development, transfer, dissemination, and diffusion of environmentally sound technologies. And we see this going on now when you talk about green technologies. Like for example, countries, I think Toyota has decided to stop, all right, uh, uh, has decided that they will not all right, manufacture cars that run on, 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 on fossil fuels, petrol, instead to start manufacturing cars, electric cars instead. And Singapore has a vision, I think, I can't remember which year, 2040, something like that, where we want to go totally electric. But of course, from now to then, right, we need some um, infrastructure that needs to be built. So that's all part of attaining some of these goals and, right, and using technology. So this is policy. And according to the gender as well, there's talk about ICT. And some of you are IT students, maybe you can leverage an ICT, all right? And we should leverage an ICT, all right, as a means all right, uh, uh, to develop better capabilities all right, to achieve the SDG goals, actually. So these are just the policy stuff, all right? But how do we actually do it? So I'm going to show you some possible achievements technology might means of some examples. So according to a survey by this uh, organization UK called Bond, they did a survey among people, and the survey showed that uh, in among the respondents, right, uh, that, that these are the top ten technologies that could be used to enhance uh, sustainable development. Actually, big data, circular economy, financial technologies, and thought, and in comes blockchain. And you can see that the AI is here as well, and green. So all these are actually the industry four point zero technologies. Actually, all right. So this is coming from surveys, and this is pretty recent. So some of the practical ways of doing it um, would be to harness digital age through the use of AI. You certainly could use AI all right, to achieve the SDG goals. According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, AI actually increased global GDP all right, because it could transform sectors. And we are starting to see this kind of things because it makes work more productive. All right, and AI allows us to monitor and manage our surveys by enabling the collection of data for analysis. All right, and you do see AI actually embedded within a lot of things that we do, including uh, all right, when we are surfing the internet. Uh, and AI can actually make big advances in many areas right, that you can see here in healthcare and culture. So this is where AI is useful. It impacts uh, a lot of the SDG goals, actually. More specifically on goals, all right, we can actually achieve zero hunger SDG number two with AI sensors, robotics, and synthetic biology. For example, using machine learning and genetic sequencing right, to identify and sequence optimal gene profiles, uh, optimize plant crop production with well, plant internet of things using the internet, right? With the data you able to see in send, which sends insights and warnings right, to farmers' smartphones. Right? And this is quite useful for farmers in the rural areas. And I think you know about uh, 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 impossible food. If you would know in the supermarkets in Singapore, it would be impossible food. We have lab grown meat. That's actually lab grown meat. And we're starting to see even insect protein into our, on our dinner table. So this is the, the biology side of things. And this is actually technology, actually. All right, but that's more on the food tech. On the health and well-being side of things, SDG3, we can again, back to square one, digital technologies. All right, such as AI, blockchain, sensors, all this, all right, can actually advance uh, human medicine, all right, along with uh, healthcare informatics, actually. Right? And th this is what we are starting to see in a lot of the developed uh, world's hospitals. All right? For example, we can use artificial intelligence all right, to predict diseases. Uh, I think there's a risk watch in the world that can actually predict whether you have diabetes or not and have some early warning. And we can use AI and blockchain to improve health data storage. Blockchain is good because then there cannot be any data tampering. Uh, and of course, uh, what's really existing is we can, there are definitely apps, right? And people have actually developed apps for allow patients to actually track their 
health actually. Seriously. All right. In fact, we can apps that track how much exercise we've done, and I actually happen to use one of those on my handful. On the front of affordable and clean energy, SDG7, again, AI blockchain advanced materials. So example, uh, solar power mini grid with battery storage in rural areas, all right, of Kenya and Zambia, which lack the cent uh, centralized power grids. Or we can even use AI and Internet of Things right, to offer uh, smart energy monitoring consumption and even use it for energy trading. A uh, blockchain can be used for peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, where as a consumer, we can actually harness solar energy and then we can sell it to other users if we didn't use all the energy. So it's pretty, pretty cool, actually. And that actually helps. While saving the earth, it can also actually bring forth prosperity. So these are some examples of technology. So as you can see here, I've actually shown you some summary of the technologies. I think you're starting to get a hint here. It's very linked to digital. It's very linked to IT. Um, all right. So, but of course, there are other technologies in the biological sciences that can be used. But I think if people are talking now, we're in a world that we're leveraging more industry 4.0 and IoT, which is more robotics. So that's why we're seeing more and more applications of such technologies right towards the genome. And it's actually, uh, uh, actually something that is pretty interesting, high tech. So in summary, this is the last slide. Technology is actually an important enabler because according to the Pricewaterhouse study, it does help to improve the prosperity of nations if you use technology to achieve the goals. But the only issue is, I think you start to realize all this technology, AI, all this digital technologies are not cheap. So the problem is the poorer countries may not be able to afford it. So we have to enhance the accessibility to this sustainability enhancing technologies for the less developed countries. Because if not, there will be increasing technological divide. And in fact, because of immense technology advancement, we are seeing greater technological divide. So something must be done. So that is why we must have that North-South cooperation. So to end off, we must accelerate with the achievement of the goals as one world because of rapid climate change. All right. So just as we had past achievements, all these achievements we wiped out. All right. If you don't run faster, because the world is changing and these changes are beyond our control. All right. Thanks for tuning in. And I guess uh, we have the question and answer later. Thank you so much. Okay. So I just unshare my screen now. Okay. So okay. thank you, Adrian, for the insightful talk on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So um, I'm Tia and I'll be taking over from Daniel. So next up, um, we have Alex Shea. Alex is the Assistant Manager of Program Development and Learning Design at SID Institute. Alex had um, eight years of experience working with education ministries, teacher training institutes and universities to support education reforms and training for over 80,000 teachers in various countries. He was formerly the Assistant General Secretary of the Singapore Teachers Union, supporting the union in its research work, advocacy, industrial relations and policy recommendation. So now I'll pass it on to Alex. Alex, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, just a mic check, can all of you hear me? Hello. Can, can, we can hear you? Yep, Alex. you can hear me. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Alex. So uh, just a brief introduction about myself. Um, I used to be the uh, Assistant Secretary General of the Singapore Teachers Union, um, working with the primary and sec secondary school and JC teachers. And then now I'm currently with uh, SEED Institute at NTUC First Campus um, in the preschool uh, sector. So I've worked um, very closely with teachers. Um, but most of my work uh, deals with um, sharing our Singapore um, education uh, practices and, and experience with um, teachers and educators around the world. So um, if I can start um, sharing my slide, I would like to speak today about um, quality education in um, the, uh, the UN goal, which is goal number four. So uh, let me just share my slide.
Okay, so I'll be talking about um, quality education uh, and some of the things that I've done uh, across the world is um, that I have worked with uh, ministries of education, um, teachers, um, private school principals, uh, learning technology um, uh, companies and uh, many policy makers around the world uh, to look at how we can improve quality of um, education for children and, and learning across the world. So some of the countries that um, I have been, uh, been to in my work uh, includes the America, uh, China, um, Canada, uh, India, I've been to Australia, uh, Brunei as well, Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand. A um, uh, large part of my work is also in Russia and also I've been to Libya as well. So we have been to the uh, advanced uh, economies, the develop, developing economies and also the um, uh, some of the least developed uh, countries in terms of education. And I've seen uh, the education landscape at uh, many of these different countries um, at different stages of their growth. So um, talking about today's topic, I was thinking how um, education and technology can marry together. And what has, so I would like to give you a brief overview of what are the technology um, that's available for education out there. Okay, so if you um, go to Google and you type the pedagogy wheel, uh, this is the whole list of um, technology applications and uh, we call it ed tech education technology uh, that has been in the market for educators and teachers to use uh, and also for students like yourself. I'm sure many of you use uh, many of these uh, apps or softwares uh in the uh in your in your studies so um this is the fifth version of the uh Ed wheel developed by alan carrington so he has uh, tracked the different kind of um, technology applications that are out there um, and then categorize them accordingly uh to their functions and how they actually help to uh either for teachers learners to um, right. So if you are looking at a certain idea and you show that there are any um, current mark, uh, current apps out there in the market, you can take a look at this book and I'm sure you'll be able to find uh, uh, many ideas from this wheel. Okay. But um, I like to say that most of, most of the application and software on this wheel uh, are direct to students. Okay, because when we talk about education and technology, we're thinking the first thing that comes to our mind is really, um, something that the students can use, right? And that's um, a very common. But today, um, I would like to share that um, in the education sphere and the landscape, um, it goes way beyond um, just the students and, uh, and what are some of the uh, challenges in the education industry when we come to um, technology. So one of the things that... Um, we always ask ourselves is that who are the creators and users of this education technology, right? Um, one would be the students. Um, two, a large part of the users would be the teachers who use it in their uh, school, right? Because they are the one that deal directly with the, with the um, uh, students. Okay, but beyond, beyond these two main uh, uh, players, in the education uh, sector, you have to understand that there are many supporting roles uh, behind what happens uh, in the classroom, okay? We always say that um, it takes a village uh, to raise a child. So there are many people behind the scenes working to help develop a student or a child uh, in the education system. For example, um, they could be the uh, principal, they could be the uh, school counselor, so the students who have um, who are dealing with uh, certain emotional issues and it affects their learning, they will go to the school counselor. Um, there will be the learning needs um, specialist because some children and some students would, may have um, special uh, needs in learning, so there are additional support for these people. There are also the um, community community partners, so uh, people in the school who deal who liaise with the community and have special projects for children. 
right? Like your community service projects. So these are many, many different um, players and people in the school and in the education sector uh, that um, uh, will help and play the, each play their part with the with the children, right? There's also the publisher, the curriculum writer, the education technology people. So these are all different people um, in the village that helps to raise a child. But one of the key 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 problem that um, many of the schools and especially uh, many of the other nations that I've seen is that um, the most important thing that schools can do is not just to use the technology in the curriculum more but to use it more effectively, all right? So in terms when you're designing and looking at uh, curriculum, uh, sorry, when you're looking at the, your, um, your application or your IT solution, right? You have to look at how um, it is user-friendly, UI, UX, um, and the experience for the users, right? So that they can use it more effectively um, in the teaching and learning. So that's one very key thing. Because if you have a very good um, technology, but it's very hard to use and teachers are not able to use it or the um, counsellors or the other players in the uh, other uh, people in the schools are not able to use it, then um, we, we see that many of the times uh, uh, the software and hardware of the technology is being uh, obsolete and left one side. And many, many people go back to their old traditional ways of um, teaching or, or, uh, or uh, education. So that's what one very important part. So having given a, 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 a brief landscape of how um, education technology plays in the education sector, I'll move in, dive in deeper into the quality education of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, and then I'll share with you the different uh, goals in uh, number four, which is to ensure inclusive and quality education for all and to promote lifelong learning. Okay, and there are several goals from 4.1 to 4.7 and also 4A and 4C. Uh, I will briefly touch some of them and then go deeper into one or two of them, okay, because uh, of time constraint. But if you look at 4.1 to 4.3, um, it is about access to quality uh, pre-primary, which is early childhood, kindergarten, nursery, um, primary, secondary, and higher education. So this part of the goal um, deals with getting uh, ch children and students um, usually in the least developed country or the developing country into schools, right? This is very much about infrastructure, proximity. Some of them live in the rural areas, um, cultural or social issues, right? It's about giving them access to schools. And of course, technology can play a part to bridge this gap, right? If, if uh, the children are provided with both the software and hardware, and we talk about hardware, uh, we, we also talk about having the connection, having the updates to the, to, of the software and, and, and you know, the, your, your computer, laptops, tablets, electricity. So these are primary issues that um, 4.1 to 4.3 uh, is dealing with, right? Getting the students, giving them access to um, schools and um, institutions. Okay, 4.4 uh, deals with... Uh, having the number of uh, students with relevant skills for financial success. So this is about financial literacy, um, getting the competency and knowledge to know how to manage their finances. Okay, 4.5 deals with um, uh, discrimination in education. So we are talking about uh, gender discrimination in many parts of the world. Um, uh, the female students are still not getting uh, equal access uh, to the schools. And then also um, we have also your uh, your your uh, special needs uh, children and also people with um, physical disabilities. These are all forms of uh, different forms of uh, discrimination that can happen, uh, which um, we want to uh, deal with better. Okay, in terms of four point six, it's about literacy and numeracy. So these are the in education. These are the two basic skills: um, literacy, meaning languages and numeracy being numbers and mathematics. Okay, we want um, uh, the children uh, and students when they graduate from schools to have at least literacy to be able to read and write and speak and also um, numeracy skills because this is a foundation for them to move on to having um, greater job opportunities and also uh, in life as well. 
Okay, uh, four point seven deals with the uh, education for sustainable development and global citizenship. Okay, this is about um a curriculum that uh and and lessons uh to deal to to teach um children and students about uh the sustainable development goals and um global citizenship issues that glo- uh, that affect us as a global citizen such as climate change uh such as inequality around the world uh these are several issues that um the UN try to champion and try to get um students to understand okay 4.a deals with um building and upgrading uh, inclusive and safe schools uh, inclusive for all uh, genders for all ages for all kinds of families uh, for them to have a, a greater learning environment and 4.c is the increase of qualified teachers in developing countries um i will dig our go into 4.c um, a little uh, deeper in the one of the slides so i'll just go into two of the two of the main points uh one would be about uh 4.2.1 which is about uh uh access to quality pre primary uh, early childhood education which is 4.2 okay and under 4.2.1 uh about um early childhood um one of the goal is to ensure that children are developmentally on track and what do we mean by develop- developmentally on track is that um in terms of a child's growth they are progressing well uh, and growing well in terms of uh, health learning and psychosocial well-being okay um it says by sex because uh, male and female and uh, babies and children right they grow at different rates okay so uh, if uh, a 5 month old child uh, male baby and another 5 month old ba- uh, baby they should be around uh, the same uh, uh, sim- or similar uh, development in terms of their physical body and also their um, mental capacity right um of course some children will uh, be late bloomer some people uh, some children will um, uh, will will grow up uh, will grow and develop very fast but there are still some certain signs that we look out for which i will share with you later so um this is about measuring the number of percentage of uh, children under 5 years old to make sure that they are developmentally on track in at least three or four domains right literacy numeracy physical social emotional and learning okay and then we want to prepare um the boys and girls to be ready for primary education and if you look at the world map uh, according to the uh, UN um there is very very little tracking of how children are actually development development uh, development sorry how children are development uh, de- developing uh, well or not Okay, so this is a very big gap um, in this uh, uh, goal that uh, something that um, some of you can look at. Okay, so in terms of child development, so um, if you look at uh, if you just Google up child development and milestone, right, you will see that um, children at six months they should be able to turn and turn his head when you call his name, right? Children at twelve months they should be able to respond uh, when being told no. They should start to say uh, "dada" and "mama." okay and and then at at uh 18 months right they were, they are they should be able to walk slightly and then at 2 years and 3 years there are different uh, milestones okay so in terms of uh, development like we said there were three or four um uh, uh domains that we look out for a child but in singapore we actually look at um six domains of a child right literacy numeracy so language skills they should be able to uh listen uh, speak and maybe eventually write okay uh, numeracy they should be under uh, they should be able to understand um, numbers um, uh, concepts such as patterns and uh, space uh, in terms of motor skills um, we 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 kind of uh, classify them into gross motor skills and fine motor skills okay gross motor skills refers to um big movement such as uh, jumping right hopping or waving your your hands uh, above your above your head okay or throwing a ball okay so these are um gross motor skills and in terms of fine motor skills you're talking about small little movement with your hands and fingers being able to put um a uh, uh, thread through through a small ball and this kind of these are the fine motor skills that children should have 
Okay. Um, there's also arts and aesthetics and also a little bit of science in the preschool curriculum. So these are uh, what we call the developmental uh, uh, milestones. There's also one very key uh, part, which is um, social and emotional, because for very young children, um, some of them, as we know, some of them at certain age, there's the naughty two years old, uh, where they start to throw tantrum and, and, and they are unable to express that they, are, they do not like certain things and they want to get certain things. And, and because they, are not, they do not have the vocabularies, the only way to express is to throw tantrums. So, uh, trying to many teachers at this stage, right, and educators and parents at this stage are trying to get um, these children to understand how to manage their um, emotions, how to learn uh, to understand how other children are, uh, uh, how to deal with uh, have, having um, social relationship with other children. So this is social emotional skills, which are very important in young children uh, for our pre for our preschool. So. Um, this is a little bit context about uh, ensuring children are developmentally on track. So in terms of technology out there, right? Um, if you just do a simple search on, on Play Store and App Store, we realize that um, you know existing technology on this part is quite um, rudimentary and very, very simple and very basic compared to, you know, you saw the pedagogical wheel. There were so many apps out there, right? In for learning in primary and secondary school and uh, and, and, and of course in, in uh, universities, right? But in terms of preschool, you realize that um, there is a gap out there, okay? And most of these apps out there are very one-way uh, information about milestone development, um, which just tells you that, that at certain age, your child should be able to do something, right? And we also have to understand that um, tracking and observation of a child as they develop and grow is very important. And some of the apps may not be able to be, to be do that. And because as parents and as um, teachers and educators in the preschool sector, we want to um, track every child right, in terms of their growth. Right? Some, of the, some of the children could be very good with language, but not, not so strong with motor skills. And some of the children are very good with um, numeracy. Right, but they are not so strong in arts and aesthetics and colors. So, um, for educators and and parents, right, we want to track every child and to observe every child, um, and then to help them and do uh, inter what we call intervention, which is to to um, help a child in a certain aspect, right, and then pro plan pr certain uh, lessons and programs to help them. Okay, and then we also have to take into um, uh, understanding that cultural aspects. Uh, uh, of children at different uh, countries are very uh, uh, are very different. So many of these apps, if they are developed in the US, US or Western countries, right, they may not be suitable for um, children in, in Singapore or children in Southeast Asia, right? In terms of the food, in terms of the growth, in terms of the um, learnings, uh, it's very different, okay, for, for a child in uh, two different countries. So, um, information is lacking out there for educators and parents uh, for something that's localized to whether be it um, in, in Europe, in Africa, in, in Asia, and different parts of Asia. Okay, uh, We have a very big wide cultural difference and it would be, it would be nice to have something that's contextualized for a, different, uh, for a country that you may be thinking of. Okay, So um, like I say, it takes a village to raise a child. So you your users may not just be... Um, uh, the teachers, it could be the parents, it could be the doctors, uh, healthcare workers, or, or, or in, maybe in Singapore uh, context, you know, our, sometimes our children are brought up by um, domestic helpers. Okay, so um, different people play different roles to help the child. Okay, one other part of um, um, learning that um, we also look at as... Um, as educators, a special needs issue in children. So, um, of course, the first thing when we talk about special needs, first thing is um, those with uh, medical or physical uh, uh, disability. So that's one part of uh, special needs. But when we talk about special needs, there are um, way uh, there are different kind of categories. So um, there is the developmental uh, special needs. So they are um, a little bit lacking in terms of their development usually the brain. So these are the children with um, autism or Down syndrome. And because it's a spectrum, some of them will have severe um, autism and Down syndrome and some of them are uh, with a very, just very mild 
and they could be in the mainstream schools. Okay, so um, teachers and educators and special support uh, and their specialists who deal with um, such uh, students in the schools to help them in their learning. Okay, there's also um, what we call the learning needs, uh, learning needs um, disability. So these are um, children or learners and sometimes adults as well um, with uh, certain uh, 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 learning needs uh, issues such as dyslexia. But the main com most common one is dyslexia. So they are unable to um, differentiate different um, the between like uh, characters like uh, letters like uh, B, P, D, right? So it affects their learning, uh, especially in it, um, literacy. Okay, we have also the mental health issues. Um, um, and this goes beyond preschool all the way to, to adulthood, uh, teenage years and adulthood, depression, stress, um, which affects their learning as well. Okay, and then you have the behavioral um, needs, which are usually um, children and students with um, uh, what we call ADHD, hyperactive, uh, uh, hyperactive uh, children. So this is very much um, due to um, social emotional learning where um, they need to learn more uh, in terms of uh, regulating. Uh, they need to learn techniques to regulate their own um, uh, social emotional. Okay. Um, I'll spend the next five minutes on 4C, which is the supply of qualified teachers. Okay. So many of times we are focused, when we talk about education, we focus on the children. Okay. But this 4C um, uh, goal talks about qualified teacher. Okay. And when we took when we talk about teacher, right, we ask ourselves and we look think back about our time, right? Um, what does a teacher actually do? And how does a good teacher actually look like? Okay, you have I'm sure you have your experience with um very good teachers who are, you know, you like them very much. And then if you have a very not so good teacher, you realize that you start to lose interest in that subject and you uh, don't do well in that in that in that subject, right? So a teacher is quite is actually very important in education. Okay, um, if I were to outline what usually a teacher do, right, Be beyond just teaching in the classroom, right, they have to um, do assessment of um, uh, of uh, children's progress. They have to mo monitor every child and student, right, in terms of not just academic, but also social, emotional health. Um, you know, be be there to be with the with the with the students in terms of um, mental health. They will also have to deal with um, uh, parents, uh, share with parents, and because um, teacher and parents have to work together uh, with the children. So this is one big part in education, which is often um, uh, where there's a challenge because information is difficult to be shared between the parent, between the parent and the and the educators and teachers. And the teacher sometimes would bring children out for outdoor excursions, activities. They have to liaise. They have to plan. Um, such activities because it helps children's learning to bring you uh, to bring the children and the students out there to have um, authentic and genuine learning right you will also have to partner with the community right uh, to look at you know uh, community farming in the uh, uh, community farming or it could be with the science center or it could be with the um, um, learning about water right renewable energy right so you have to partner with the community to come up with projects for children and then also um, social emotional support for the children. So all, so a teacher has to juggle quite a number of things beyond just uh, teaching the subjects. So if you think about it, um, so much of our educational technology apps are focused on just teaching, but there are so many other things that a, a teacher does, right? Do we have the technology and uh, to actually give it to such, teacher, to such teachers? Okay, I'm gonna skip skip this slide, but I would say um so one part that is um very lacking is that you know as children and as students right we grow every year we learn new things, but teachers um they are also uh, they 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 are also um learning uh, new things and new uh, ways to teach in the classroom. So one of my experience um when I was in Libya was that I met a teacher, I met a, a couple of teachers right. Who have been teaching for twenty years, and when wow, we are, I mean, teachers with with twenty years of teaching experience are very experienced, right? But then after the, after we start talking to them, we realize that 
you know, um, they've been teaching 20 years in the classroom uh, of primary two students. So every year, the primary two students comes in and then he will teach the same uh, primary two topics, it could be mathematics, uh, to the children. And then uh, uh, and then the, the end of the year, they, she takes a new class and, and uh, starts the whole cycle again. So you're doing the 20 years of about almost the same thing. So we thought, you know, where is this teacher heading? Where is she growing? How, how is she growing? Right? Is she learning new things? Okay, so in, 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 in education and, and um, this part about um, supply of uh, qualified teachers, we have to look at both um, what we call the pre-service uh, teaching and the in-service teaching, right? Teachers have to be trained, right? You know, there are some good teachers and there are some not, go not so good teachers, right? Teachers who may be very well versed in their subject, but they are not so good at explaining the concepts. And this, that's because very much because um, of the training and the pedagogy skills that these teachers uh, use, right? If they are coming back to this, um, coming back to this, you know, as, as, as humans, we, we do lifelong learning, right? And every time we learn something new, we, uh, we should be um, fulfilled and satisfied that we attain some, a new knowledge. But for that teacher, you know, 20 years of doing the same thing. Well, of course, she's happy to, to, to share what she learns with the children. But um, we also have to understand that uh, as an adult, she is also trying to learn. She, she, has, she, has, she, has, she hasn't been to any uh, workshops or learning to, you know, how she can grow herself or, or train her own teaching skills. So that was something that uh, we had to work with the ministry to say that, you know, this group of teachers who have been in the service for a very long time, you know, they need training and reskilling, right? They need to learn about new technologies, new skills to teach. So that's about um, helping our teachers grow as well. So as they grow, they become, you know, um, more competent, skilled, and they are probably more happy, right? Because they learn new skills and then they'll be able to share with the children. So this part of the um, SDG talks about supply of qualified teachers. And again, if you look at it, um, what the UN measures is the number of teachers who are actually qualified and trained uh, to, uh, to, to uh, teach in the classroom and in schools, right? And I realized that when I travel to so many of the countries around the world, um, Singapore, we are in a very fortunate place because um, our teachers here, right, they would uh, go through, for primary and secondary school teachers, right, we have the National Institute of Education, NIE, where teachers go through... Um, at least one and a half years, if they already have a degree, they go through another one and a half years of uh, training to teach a certain subject. Or um, if they have completed their A-levels or diploma, they'll go through about a four years uh, degree program, right? So you are, so that they are trained in, a, uh, in certain subjects, for example, physical education, right? They, they learn everything about PE and they learn how to teach PE, right? Or they can learn about geography and they learn how to teach geography to, to students okay but we realized that in many parts of the i realized that in many parts of the world some of the teachers are um, they could graduate with their um, uh, secondary education or or a bachelor degree right um, in a certain subject it could be geography it could be mathematics but they have not learned they have not been through any form of specialized um, teacher training okay meaning they have not learned how to deal with the management in the classroom. They have not learned to uh, uh, observe how children are learning. Okay, so if I look at this um, map from uh, BBC, you realize that many of these countries, especially in orange, uh, are the ones that require some form of uh, specialized teacher training. Uh, and then the ones in blue are the ones that says that they have a bachelor degree and some form of specialized teacher training. Okay, but the ones in red and there are some of the countries, they do not have any uh, teacher training for the, uh, for the teachers. So that's quite um, uh, concerning for, for many of the educators out there. Okay, so we have to look at um, what are the tools that we can help teachers to grow in their own personal capacity and also what are the tools that can help them in their roles, okay, in their day-to-day -day, uh, teaching.
hey, coming back, um, I hope that you can also think of beyond just teachers, but also the school attendant, the counsellors, sometimes even the bus drivers, the parents, the families, the domestic helpers, um, uh, because it takes a village to raise a child. So um, think about what uh, you can uh, develop for these uh, different people, for the young children, and also um, for the teachers as well. Okay, um, come to the last of my uh, last slide. I'll end my slideshow here, and I'll be happy to take any question that you have. Okay, so thank, thank you, you, Alex, for the sharing session on quality education. So not only do I gain more understanding on the train side, but I also gain more understanding on the teacher side. So yeah, I also agree that it's also not just like developing more technologies, but like better technologies. And so now we'll be having the Q&A segment. So if you guys have any questions, do type them down in the chat box. So... I think we have the first question, which is um, to Adrian. So hi, Dr. Adrian. In your opinion, generally, what are the main challenges confronting sustainable development? From Hui Ming. Um, Dr. Adrian, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So if you're talking about, it depends on which perspective you're coming from. So obviously, if you're talking about policy making level, then um, financing money is the issue. All right, as I talk about the technological divide, all right, technological divide is uh, becoming an increasing challenge in the world, where the developing world, uh, especially the third world countries, will be because of lack of access to funds and funding, all right, will fall behind, even though the technologies exist. So something must be done. At the individual level, all right, then you must all you must know um, how to use available technology, put it into a new system, right, the science behind it to solve the problem. So the creativity and innovation. So this these are some of the challenges. Depends on the, the perspective you're taking. By and large, but generally speaking also, um, as you saw in my presentation, it does involve the use of money. So if there's one important factor, it's definitely the finances. Okay. Yes, yes. I agree with you that sometimes the financial is limiting the thing. Okay, so we'll have the next question from um, Mr. Alex. So to ask from educators' viewpoint, it is about getting correct answers and following instructions and grades. So to them, it is everything. So why we refuse to move beyond that from Royston? I think um, from, an education, from an educator point of view, um, uh, there's two parts to this. One will be the examinations and one will be about learning. All right, We have to understand that um, in learning, one part of uh, how we assess learning is through examination. So when it comes to, uh, and, and especially in the US, right, there's a huge debate whether um, we should even have standardized testing and exams for children because it does not measure, uh, it is only one form of measurement of learning how effectively a child has learned in the classroom. So um, I think many uh, parents and people forgot to see that exam, for, we may not understand that exam is only one tool, right, that an educator used to um, assess how a child has learned. Okay, and especially for very young children, um, they may not have that. Uh, very much, very large part of exam is about the technique of handling the exam, the stress, you know, understanding how MCQ works, understanding how to answer to the to the exam. That's a, that, that's a very large part of how you get very high scores in your exams, right? And and um, through exams, and that uh, is one form of assessment of how much a child has learned, but also a factor is um, how good a child is at exam techniques. But for trained educators, right, we understand that there is only one form. The other forms we have, we look at what we call... Um, uh, formative assessment. So exams are summative assessment, right? We sum, 
we summarize what they have learned. But for formative, for formative assessments for educators, we look at in the progress from um, them not knowing anything or they may know certain things uh, 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 about a certain topic, for example, um, uh, animal and habitats. All right. So when we plan lessons across, um, let's say the term, we will start with we try to assess at this uh, before teaching anything. Right? Do do students understand what are animal habitats? Do they know that fishes and whales and dolphins live in the ocean, right? And then some animals they live in the swamps, they live in the forest, right? So they may be able to answer. They may not be able to answer. So we know that some children already know. Some children may not know. Right. And then as we progress, then we realize that okay, these children who knows, we can get that, we will get them to um do a little bit more. And those who do not know, um, we will try to um teach in a different way. So and then we observe how they grow and their understanding of knowledge and how they apply knowledge across the whole uh, term or semester. And that's what we call the um uh formative assessment, right? As we as they grow and then we observe them and see how they answer in the classroom, how they do their projects and assignments. Right, they, whether they understand uh, the concept of uh, of um, uh, animal and habitat habitats. So, um, so actually, project work and assignments and you know, um, crafts. Right, in primary school, if you remember, sometimes when you talk about habitats, you use your plasticines to to put out the 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 pond, the forest for the different animals. These are actually um, checkpoints, right, to say that actually the child understands. They may not be able to to get the right answer in the exam, but they are able to explain it through um, mock-ups and plasticine. So as an educator, we understand that, okay, the child actually understands. They may not give the correct answer in the exam, right? For for many other reasons. It could be due to stress. It could be due to several things, right? The child may not be feeling well that day. But, you know, when we look at different um, um, different forms of um, checkpoints and, and how we assess and monitor the child, Day to day in the project and then also the exams, then we know whether a child has learned. Okay, thank you, Alex. So now we have the third question. Mm -hmm. So to Dr. Adrian and Mr. Alex, with the global financial crisis due to COVID 19, growth rates fell and unemployment rose. So poverty or hunger is deepening. So I think there's a second part to this question. Um, so in such a situation when the resources around the world are already stretched, what should be the first thing or priority that should be tackled in terms of the 17 goals from Carissa? Okay, then uh, I will address this first and then I'll give Alex the thing. Um, I'll go with the line of the 17 goals. La. Um, as you know, the 17 goals are not easy to implement. Um, the issue now is it's coming from a world body and then going into the nations. Uh, we're seeing poverty, hunger, uh, and this pandemic is seems like it might it really is, I think it's not is it, it's actually setting the world back by, if the WHO has said, uh, yeah, even the, the economic bodies have said, this probably is gonna set us 10, 20 years back, even for Singapore, All right? So um, the thing is there needs to be a lot of integration. So that is a message coming. If you read the, the, the 2030 agenda, the key, the crux of implementation is integration. Actually, goal number 17 is the answer to implementing the 17 goals. Goal number 17 says that. The issue is the world is not working together as you can see in the world what's happening now. So that's the thing. People have to come to the, the table and, and talk it out. All right. So hopefully with the new US president, we will see some changes. At least now people are now talking about climate again. All right. Uh, because the ex-US president, don't mind me saying, doesn't care about the environment. But the issue is how is all this uh, international agenda, UN's international, is cascading down to the nations. And that really depends on the national development. Some countries cannot afford it. Some people, the developing world is actually asking, I don't have the finances. How am I going to do it? They're actually saying that. Can we get help? And 
a very good illustration is look at the vaccine, the way they we roll out the vaccine. The richer countries are hoarding for themselves, like France is trying to stop the shipment of vaccines out to the developing world. So if you see that happening now, how on earth is that going to be cascading? Uh, international goals are going to cascade to the nations where everyone is wanting to help themselves, but that's human nature. And the next level of uh, difficulty is even if the countries adopt and Singapore is one of those that okay we want to adopt green technology clean energy and you know all this uh, electric cars but people are asking now how are we going to set up with the structure and how can organizations and companies actually implement it so companies are questioning them out but at least we do see uh, companies in Singapore they are setting up things like corporate social responsibility like DBS I understand uh, it's actually monitoring has actually decided on some SDG goals and they're actually putting as part of their corporate social responsibility. Yeah, so by, but however, by and large, um, most organizations are only concentrating on environment aspects, not so much on the poverty end of things. So the issue is about how do the international goals get cascaded down to the international, uh, to, the, to, the, to the lower level of society. That's this issue. That's why I have to say. Okay, on my end, um, I'll just drew in specifically to um, education. Um, so, in t so what happens um, when COVID strikes, right? Um, we realize that it's a challenge and also at the same time an opportunity uh, for, for many of the educators, right? Because on one hand, um, uh, classes have stopped, right? And in many of the countries around the world, uh, classes have um, and have stopped for a very, very long while. Okay, so the first thing that um, many of the governments and countries around the world, um, when, cri when crisis hit, right, is to deal with the, you know, if, if you look at Maslow hierarchies of need, the most basic needs, right, the, the physical needs, you make sure that you have your hygiene, sanitation, um, shelter, and, and children are healthy. That's the, uh, that's the first thing. Right? And beyond that, we realize that education is still a very big priority in many of the countries, right? Because this, um, this, is, uh, this is the children are our, our future, right? So there are many different ways of how um, uh, governments deals with um, getting uh, education to, to continue. And technology plays a very big role actually in this COVID uh, world. Okay, because one thing is, um, then that's where the, the technology uh, divide comes in. Because those without technology access, um, they could when they, and and when school stops, they couldn't continue, right? Whereas those with um technology access, um, we could still continue classroom through home based learning through Zoom like this, right? And then we realize that um educators and 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 teachers around the world are starting to use uh, online learning, so that becomes a a, a new opportunity. Like now, how we are doing it across the world with different speakers, um, we are able to hear from different things. That's uh, beneficial for for um, students around the world. But also at the same time, um, many of the educators and teachers are also struggling with new technologies, trying to um, trying to understand and trying to um, teach in a way that benefits our children when there's no physical touch, especially right um, for preschool, right when we had I was I was. Um, with um, some of my colleagues and we are saying that with mask right in the preschool where we used to have face shield but now we have mask what happens in um, in, early, uh, in early child and children is that when we learn um, phonics and alphabet like b the right children needs to look at the mouth right because they are trying to emulate and see that mm, m mm, right b b so with the mask on you know something the the the, the something it, it becomes more difficult to to learn right so um while i understand that now they're trying to come up with some like uh, transparent mask to overcome this but you know there are certain new um challenges and also uh, uh opportunities to to learn right teachers have to um, deal with not um, being able to be there in the classroom for everyone a smaller size classroom children are uh, may not be able to 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 mingle and integrate and, and you know play together like like they used to so um, then it becomes a new challenge and skills for teachers, right? We need teachers who are uh, skilled and uh, trained again, retrained again for, uh, in this new um, challenging world. Okay, thank you, Alex and Adrian. So 
yeah, I believe technology plays a huge role. Okay, so for the last question, we have um, one final, last final question we have. Um, so all countries have a part to play in achieving the 17 SDG goals. So however, developing countries have challenges because of the lack of many basics such as healthcare, food, education, and so on. And they often need help from other countries. So how can such developing countries progress or even stay afloat at such difficult times? As mentioned by Carissa, when resources are already stretched from all. Okay, no specific speaker, right? I guess um, we all have to talk. <laughs> and share. That's my answer. Hopefully, we'll come to that. I think um, from my experience, I think uh, where, where countries are at a better um, um, stage and, and able to help, like uh, in Singapore, you know, part of my job is to share some of our best practices and trainings and skills and experience with, um, with teachers and educators in the developing countries, right? Some of the teachers in Singapore, our teachers are quite fortunate. We have ample training. We have ample um, continuous training. But like I said, in Libya, that teacher has been teaching for 20 years, has never attended any form of training, right? So um, as much as possible, we can share. Um, and in the past, right, when we talk about um, training teachers, we would have to fly down our, our trainers, our experienced teachers into another country and stay for four days, five days, or even a month long, right? To, to, to share with um, maybe 80 or 100 teachers. But now with Zoom and with um, technology, we can actually um, cascade and broadcast it to a wider audience uh, around the world, right? So if I want to do a training to teachers in India, right? We can actually just go through um, WebEx or if, if, if it is with other parts of the world with uh, Zoom, right? So there are many... Uh, possibilities in this new um, era where we are able to leverage on technology and to help with um, training of teachers and uh, learning and learning and education around the world. Okay, so, um, so, um, so that's the end of the Q&A segment. So before that, um, we will have a photo taking session. So, um, we we'll encourage all those in Zoom to turn on your cameras. Okay, so now we'll wait for them to turn on the cameras. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, I think Shafiq has taken the screenshot. Okay, so... Yep, so I want to say a big thank you to our speakers, Adrian and Alex, and thank you everyone for attending this afternoon session. So we, all, we hope you had a wonderful time and see you again soon tonight for our session three, 7.30 p.m. on panel discussion with past year's Solution Challenge 2020 finalists. So last but not least, I would like to thank our sponsors. So um, the platinum sponsors we have Emmy and Fishpot. And Go sponsors, we have Wantily. And Silver sponsors, we have StreamYard. And we also like to thank the prize sponsor, Google, and our online venue partner, Google Developer Space, and our community partner, Google Developer Experts, Google Cloud, GDG Singapore, and Google Developer Student Clubs and our educational education partner, PSB Academy. So these are all our sponsors and thank you for supporting us in Ideaton 2021. So lastly, follow us on our social media channels, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn for more updates. So you, you also can check out our um, website so more details can be found in the website. So thank you everyone, bye-bye. Developer Student Clubs are university-based communities where students learn about Google technology and use their skills to solve local problems.
Welcome to the Developer Student Club's 2020 Solution Challenge Demo Day. Let's check out the Solution Challenge. Let's do this. Okay, I'll present my screen. Welcome to the Google Developer Student Club's 2021 Solution Challenge. The mission of this challenge is to use Google technology to solve for one of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, aiming to end poverty, ensure prosperity, and protect the planet. Win cool prizes, mentorship from Google, and swag. Get help along the way from Google at training events, code labs, and hackathons. Submit your solution by March 31st, 2021. Register today. We can't wait to see what you build. Let's get started. Eighty-two percent of teams struggle with inefficiency and innovation. Testing and validating ideas is still a tedious physical process involving pens, post-its, and it's difficult for teams to work remotely. Tracking the progress of multiple projects and storing their data is a complex and laborious task. Innovation teams also work on ideas in silos due to the lack of collaborative tools. This leads to a lot of innovation data being lost. Introducing PitchSpot. PitchSpot digitizes innovation frameworks for teams to discover, share, and build validated ideas for product development and venture creation. Reimagine innovation with PitchSpot. Here's how it works. Structure, test, and validate ideas on widely recognized innovation frameworks, such as the Business Model Canvas. Build roadmaps, workflows, and prioritize tasks to gather feedback for ideas. Ensure data security for your ideas stored in the cloud with SSL TLS encryption. Sign up for free to test and validate your ideas. Share your canvas with collaborators or share a view-only link with mentors, stakeholders, and potential investors. Learn faster, measure better, and build validated ideas with PitchSpot, your global launchpad for ideas. Speaking at an Airmeet event? Awesome! Allow us to help you with the basics of Airmeet. As a speaker, you will be provided with a unique speaker link to enter the Airmeet event. Click on the link and you will directly enter the Airmeet. No sign-in required. In case you have any issues with the link, don't sweat. You can just enter the session directly and ask the host to invite you on stage as a speaker. Once you've entered the Airmeet, you will land in the reception area. The reception is the official welcome area of Airmeet. Here, you can see what's happening live on stage. Check out the public chat and DM the host of the event to learn about your schedule. Click the Sessions tab and you will be able to see the Go Backstage button for the session you are mapped to. Enter the backstage to have a private conversation with the host before the event, do a dry run, or to simply test your audio, video, and presentation. Once everything is in order, the host will be starting the session. If the session is already live by the time you enter the event, you will be directly taken to the live stage. Once the session has begun, you can present your content, share your screen, and connect with participants via chat, Q&A, emoji reactions, live polls, etc. You can also request the host to play your pre-recorded content in the live stage. You can switch layouts and put highlight focus on a particular speaker. Participants can use the raise hand feature to request to share the stage with you and interact with you directly. Post your session, you can visit the lounge. The lounge allows you to interact with the participants and build meaningful connections through virtual tables and speed networking. And last but not the least, to ensure a seamless speaking experience, you're expected to log in with laptops and desktops with Chrome 79 Plus, Firefox 76 Plus, Internet Edge, and Brave browsers with a minimum internet speed of 10 megabytes per second. If you are in an unsupported browser or device, you will not be able to present, speak, or interact in an AirMeet event. Have a fantastic and engaging speaking experience with AirMeet. Hi everyone. The mission of this year's Google Developer Student Club Solution Challenge is to solve for one or more of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals using Google technology.
citing the official United Nations website, these goals are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. They address the global challenges we face, including poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, peace, and justice. During this video, I will show you how you can research these goals and brainstorm ideas for your Solution Challenge project. So starting with the official UN SDG site, the first thing I suggest you do is click on each of the goals and read the challenges each goal faces. For example, goal one, no poverty. This page will give you a good primer to the challenges we face on our road to no poverty. And down at the bottom of the page, you can take a look at the facts and figures and the breakdown of targets defined for each goal. There's also an infographic you can check out to get a high level overview of the current state of things as it relates to the specific goal. Go over the rest of the goals to get familiarized with them and see if any ideas come to mind about solutions you can build using technology. If ideas do arise, write them down to brainstorm further later. Another great site that can really help you generate solution ideas is DIAL, which stands for Digital Impact Alliance. We're going to focus on two tabs, SDGs and the building blocks, but I urge you to look at the other tabs. They're just as useful for your ideation stage. Okay, so let's look at the SDGs tab and take a look at goal two, zero hunger. This goal has eight targets, which help you focus on solving a certain aspect of the goal. For example, target one, which summarizes as end hunger by ensuring access by all people to good, healthy food all year round. Okay, so immediately ideas start to spark. Maybe you can build a charity app that either accepts donation safe healthy food or accepts monetary donations dedicated to providing food. Or maybe you can build a volunteering platform that brings people together to help the community at risk. Brainstorm with your team and see what aspects of these problems you are familiar with, or maybe you have access to communities who are dealing with the challenge. Having personal knowledge of a problem will allow you to design solutions which are far more effective and easier to adopt. Now, let's take a look at goal 10, reduced inequalities. Target one, achieve and sustain income growth for the bottom 40% of the population at a rate higher than the national average. What a well-defined target. Okay, so now you can start brainstorming again on how you can achieve progress through technology here. Maybe you can build an app or a platform that educates people on financial and saving strategies. Or maybe you can help small businesses grow through education apps or e-commerce and marketing apps that are specific to your community. For example, in my community, the elderly struggle with finding online educational content and I might consider building an elderly-friendly educational platform. This platform can potentially provide the elderly with equal opportunities at learning new skills and at increasing their income. You'll see that going through these web pages will spark many ideas in your mind. Write them down and discuss them with your team. See which idea really strikes a chord with your ability and your belief. You'll be working on this for a while. You want to solve a goal that you are passionate about or that's really close to home. In the next video in the series, I'll be going through a demo case study. I'll pick up an idea and simulate the steps my team and I will take towards a successful demo submission. I hope the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals inspire you to solve for your community in a meaningful way. We can't wait to see all of your demo submissions.